Thank you. Please be seated. Wow. Thank you for making me feel so welcome. And uh, thank you for everybody that's grabbed me in the hallways and elevators and <laughs> everywhere. It's a, quite, a, quite a joy. God is... Uh, God's done some great, great and wonderful things, hasn't he, in all of our, in all of our lives, all of our lives. Again, I want to say thank you, Randy, for inviting me, and uh, again, I count it as an honor to be here. I don't, I don't say that with flattery. I don't say that frivolously. I say that because I mean that. So it's very, very good to be here. Last night, we talked about, about the issue of power and authority and we see power a lot in the church, but we don't see a lot of authority in the church, especially, especially demonstrative authority. And, and when you, when you, I mentioned that you conquer with power, but you rule with authority. The, the right hand of the king is, is power. Kill this guy, raise this guy up. Left hand is authority. Build this road put these people in jail, it's, it's authority. It's within the kingdom. Authority is within the kingdom. Power is for outside to expand the kingdom. The problem is there's so many spiritual leaders who try to rule with power instead of ruling with authority. And when you rule with power, you become a dictator. When you rule with authority, you do so because you have favor with God and man. And so dictators rule by positional authority versus popular or the people's authority. And so we want to always, we leaders always want to recognize that while we don't do the will of the people, we do the will of God, God puts it into the hearts of the people to give us favor. We don't just, we can't demand it. Again, if we demand it, that's called power. And that's what dictators are made of. That's what tyrants are made of. So I felt like it was important to say that before I begin the, the teaching this afternoon. I've been involved 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, some, some of my interns came to me and they said, John Paul, we, we noticed that down at one of the bookstores here in, in, in the area, which is at that time Fort Worth, Texas, that they're doing, they're doing psychic readings, horoscope readings, and tarot card readings, and what, what do you say if we go there and we do dream interpretations and spiritual readings? And I said, great idea, let's, let's do it. So we went to the bookstore, my interns did, they went to the bookstore and they met with the, the manager of the bookstore and the manager said, okay, I had a dream eight years ago, no one has been able to interpret. And if you can interpret it, I'll give you a shot. So she sat down at her desk and, and told the dream, and they got the interpretation. Told her the interpretation. In, during the interpretation, she slides out of her chair onto the floor crying behind her desk. She gets up and says, okay, I'll give you a shot. <laughs> well, she gives us the worst possible time like 7 to 9 o'clock on a Saturday night the, the, in the middle of the month when everybody's already spent their money because she didn't know how well we would go over. We went there, interpreted dreams, prophesied. That's what spiritual readings is. It's really prophecy. And by the end of the night, we had to carry people to their cars because they still hadn't composed themselves enough to walk out on their own. They had people coming back to the store saying, when are they coming back? When are they coming back? We will pay for them to come back. Whatever the cost is, we'll pay for it. The impact was so, so great. Now, 20 plus years later, that is happening all over the United States and all over the world, actually. Back in, 19, in the 1990s, it was happening nowhere. We received an incredible amount of criticism because of it. How dare you take the gospel to those who are in the New Age or in the occult? 
And I said, where were you before you got saved? <laughs> you may not have been in the new age or the occult, but you were far from God. And I said, this is the largest unreached people group in America. What do you mean don't go near them? So the Lord began to take us into those incredible environments. And he began to talk, talk with us and teach us. And we begin to talk with them and teach them. We go into incredible places like Burning Man. For the last number of years, we've been in Burning Man. That's where a week-long festival in the high desert of Nevada, 52,000 tents will be set up in a semicircle around a 30-foot-tall wooden structure that will burn at the end of the week. They'll set it on fire. This man, this wooden man they build, they'll set on fire, and they'll throw all their cares, cares into the fire believing that that will burn up their past and start a whole new life for them. They do the same thing every year. <laughs> when we started going there over eight years ago, we were, you were put into the semicircle in the order of your popularity or newness. So if you're on the back row of this semicircle, then you're a brand new tent. And if you're on the front row, then you're among the most popular tents. We are on the, for the last three years, have been on the front row. <laughs> among the top five out of 52,000. Not because we compromise the word, but because we show them something they've never seen before. We have lines of people that will line up outside of the tent that will wait anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours just to get into the tent to pick from a menu board that we have called Spirit Cafe Menu. <laughs> so we have dr dream interpretation, pretty obvious. We have spiritual readings, which is prophecy, spiritual cleansing, which is deliverance, and, and, and so on. And... Spiritual alignment and, and all these things, they have, there's Christian meanings behind it, but we use terminology that will pique their interest. We have people come to Jesus every year there, and we have people come to Jesus after they leave there because the Holy Spirit won't let them go. We have teachers, doctors, attorneys, judges, not only from the United States, from multiple different countries that will come there. We do the same thing in Salem, Massachusetts. We do the same thing at Mardi Gras. We do the same thing at, at, at Sundance Film Festival. We, teams go out all over the United States, all over the world. They used to never go out. But we've learned some things in the process. We've learned some things about how, how things work. We've gotten wiser. We've gotten shrewder. We, we know how to, how to work it better because we don't, again, we don't compromise, but we talk about Jesus for example, who is the true light of the world? There is only one. It's not Krishna. It's not some avatar. It's not some ascended master. It's not some swami. It's not some guru. There's only one. And so people come to meet him there. People wonder about our aura. You go, oh. You can't have an aura and be a Christian? <laughs> Look, how many of you have said, I'm going to have an aura or not going to have an aura? <laughs> it's not like it's your choice. <laughs> what did Moses have when he came down from the mountain? See, we get so caught up in our Christian terminology that we, we forget there's an unreached world out there. And so they say, you have an aura. And I, and I go, great. They say, well, it's really unusual. We don't see auras like yours here very often. <laughs> great. Well, what does your aura mean? Have you ever studied your aura? I said, yes. <laughs> well, what does your aura mean? I said, it comes from the perfect light. <gasps> oh. 
the pure light. Oh. Well, can I know that pure light? Can I have, lay hands on me? Now get this, I say, lay hands on me and give me this pure light. I say, I can't do that. I can't give you the pure light. Only you can ask him for it and he will freely give it. Well, how do I ask? How do I ask for this pure light? What do I do? How do I ask for this pure light? Very easy. Just say, pure light of the world, make yourself known to me. And it's, if you really believe it, if you're really hungry for it, you're not dabbling around. He doesn't believe in dabbling. He isn't going to touch you if, you if you're just saying, I want to dabble in another light. Because he's a very jealous light. And I have to warn you, before you ask for this pure light, once you get this pure light, every other light will seem so dim to you. And you'll end up, you'll end up not going to the light you used to go to. Are you ready to do that? For the pure light? Yes. Of course. Okay. Eight out of ten who pray that prayer will drop like a rock in two seconds. And you watch their body move and contort, and you see God moving and delivering them right there. They'll get up, and out of those eight out of, those eight, out of ten, eight out of those ten will come up and say, I just met Jesus, didn't I? Now, you see, we don't have to tell them who he is. We tell them who he is without telling them who he is. See, it's very important that we understand the power of God to prove himself. We carry something inside of us that make him known to those who didn't know he existed like this. We carry a spirituality that is so foreign yet so attractive, but we don't know how to present who we are to them. One of the first times we ever did an outreach in a, in a New Age fair very large coliseum type of, of place, uh, covered, domed, huge outreach, and um, had incredible people. The Kabbalah was sending us their people to get their dreams interpreted. I mean, it was really kind of strange. We, came, we became like, in, in one four-day period, we became like the experts in, it, in things. And, and so God was touching and moving, and at the end of it, I went up to the woman, I said to her, is it, is it okay if we come back next year? And she goes, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you. And I go, uh-oh. I said, well, is something wrong? She goes, well, wrong is not really the word. I have to ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, go ahead and ask. She said, I don't know. Please don't be offended. I said, okay, I promise I won't be offended. She said, are you a spiritual vampire? <laughs> I'm telling you, that was not on my chart right at that moment. <laughs> Are you a spiritual vampire? And I go, no. No, I said, why? She said, because we've had a lot of complaints that whenever you get near any booth here, they lose their ability to read people. I said, no, I am not a spiritual vampire, but here's the truth, a spiritual truth. It's very simple, I said. Whenever a greater power meets a lesser power, the lesser power loses. 
And she said, that's what I told them. <laughs> you just met a greater power. Yes, you can come back. We'll have people come into our tents at various places and, and they know that we're busy. They see the line outside. Many of them have been ministered to before. And they come in and they'll say, can we just sit? We feel safe here. And we'll watch them. And, and we're, we're not talking about sitting for 10 minutes. We're talking about sitting for 6, 12 hours. And you'll watch them. You'll watch, you'll watch the Holy Spirit just move in them. Many of them start out in, in, a, in a lotus position, but then they'll move to a fetal position. And you just watch God taking them through layer by layer of unwrapping and healing in their lives. And we get dozens and dozens of letters from people who say, I came to know Jesus because of you. And it's not like the next day, we get them three years later, two years later, six years later. Teachers in Chile, judges in South Africa, lawyers in, lawyers in Europe. And God touches people and changes people's lives. Let me just tell one more incident that really was a catalyst in, in, in my life and, and in what we do. I'm in Salem, Massachusetts, and I'm talking to the head witch of New England. He's a big boy. He's like six foot four, 340, 50 pounds, big. And he's done everything he can to look like a witch. I mean, he's tattooed his cuticles, he's, he's inked his fingernails, he's tattooed eyeliner, not just eyeliner, but tattooed eyeliner. All the stuff, and so I'm talking to him, and as I'm, as I'm talking to him, we're, we're facing each other, he turns away from me about the middle of a 45-minute conversation. He goes, and he keeps talking. And I think he's talking to me. I'm not sure if he's talking to a demon or talking to me at first. But then he kind of turns and says, pardon me for, I don't want to be rude, but the light coming from you hurts my eyes. And, and I keep hearing these voices that say, curse him, curse him, curse him. And he said, but you seem like such a nice, loving man. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so he says, if you don't mind, I'll just turn away and we can keep talking. So I said, okay. <laughs> so we kept talking. I'm talking to his back and he's talking <laughs> to me. During the conversation, I, uh, he, at the end of it, he turns around to face me, and I, I said, before I leave, can I just ask you a question? I said, what, what made you become a witch? He says, well, you won't believe it. I said, well, try me. I've heard a lot. He said, okay. He said, I was raised in church. In fact, I was accepted by Ramah Bible College to go to Ramah. I go, no, lie? He goes, no, true. He said, do you know it? And I said, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. I said, what happened? He said, well, the summer before I was to enroll at Rhema, between my senior year and my freshman year, I had a, I had a spiritual experience. It was the most powerful thing that ever happened to me. It was, it was so amazing to me. And so I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor, this is what's happened to me. What, what happened? What is this? And my pastor looked at me and said, God doesn't speak that way anymore. That was the devil. He said, I pushed back from his desk, stood up, walked to the door, and said, I've seen more power in this than I've ever seen in this church. I'm going to go find the devil. He said, I walked out the door, and I found him. I said, tell me what happened. If you don't mind, would you just tell me what happened? And he tells me what happens, and I said, I called him by name, and I said, do you know? I said, look, that was from God calling you to be a pastor. He was telling you, you had a, a gift to understand spiritual things. 
that you have a gift to rally people to a cause, that you have a gift to bring people into a, an entirely new destination than where they were. I said, do you understand this is God calling you to the ministry, not to this? And in just a moment, I saw a tear drop down his cheek, and he goes, I know, but it's too late now. He died four months later from a drug overdose. Now, the good news is that in that four months, he started hanging out with, with our team and our interns there in Salem. And he began to, to talk to us about God. And in fact, on Halloween, when he's supposed to be at this large orgy, he refused to go because he was enjoying talking to us more. In fact, he asked my interns if, he could, if they would call his mom just to prove that he was in church on Halloween and not in some bed on Halloween. <laughs> his mom's a Christian, started crying, weeping on, on the phone. He began to hang out more and more with us, and the police suspect that he that he was actually injected with an overdose because he was getting too close. I believe he actually probably came to know the Lord. But it, it catalyzed something in me, and that's why I'm going to talk about this message I have today. What is true spirituality? What is pseudo-spirituality? What is it about the New Age that is so attractive to those who once were in church but are not now? What is it that, that gives them such seemingly spiritual nature and they seemingly have insight into things and, we, and many, many of us listen? Many listen to them. Many listen to, to Wayne Dreyer, who believes there's many ways to God. Many listen to Marianne Williamson, who believes there's many ways to God. Many listen to Anthony Robbins. Many listen to all these, these teachers that are out there that espouse this, some, this spirituality of some and different facets of it and different ways to it. But they, they endorse this. I'm watching some of the excerpts on YouTube from, from Oprah Winfrey and Eckhart Tolle, who they did a webinar, and over a million people signed up for this webinar around the world. And I watched people, because they, they showed video pictures, and you could be on like Skype video and, and so on, and if you didn't have a video, you could send in your picture, and they would put it up on the screen as they're talking to you. So they'd be in part of the screen and Oprah and Eckhart Tolle would be in the other. And they're talking about all this. And I watch this and I watch Christians say, I know this is God. I've been praying that God would send me an answer to my questions. And I'm going, no, no, no. And yet, millions of people are watching this and equating this to Christianity. And I said, this is not right. This is not right. How could Christians confuse this with that? Go ahead and bring those, those out, guys. Um, so what is spirituality? The world's hungry for it. We see it all over the place. We see it in movies. We see it in uh, theaters. We see it on uh, television programs. Let's put that right back, right there, if you would. Yeah, that's good. That way people can see, you guys can see down there. We'll do it like that, that way, okay. We go to these new age fairs, and 95% and of all the people tell us they were raised in church. How can this be? See, what we're finding is that the world has redefined the term spirituality, and the church has accepted it. 
To the world, spirituality is a greater wisdom. It's a combination of self-control and intellect uh, and agreeing with common values of the metaphysical, they call it. It's nothing really more than embracing the rule of the soul, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil over the tree of life. And that's what you have up here, represented up here, up here. This represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this represents the tree of life here. And in the very beginning, God gave us the rules of the garden, the rules of life. It really boils down to, to very, very simple. It's very simple. The Bible tells us that a time is coming. A time, first, our, first Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Depart from the faith. 95%, as I said, were once believers. They have departed and are giving heed to doctrines of demons, thinking God is giving them the answer. You see, the church is in a crisis, but we don't yet know we're in a crisis. The United States, the church attendance in the United States has declined at the fastest rate in the history of this nation. Individuals are flooding flooding towards distorted spirituality and influences at unheard of rates. Just look at the increase alone in vampire TV programs, which, by the way, is the opposite of eat my flesh and drink my blood, which Jesus said. Vampirism, the idea of it is simply the drinking of blood. It's not the blood of a Savior. It's to make you the Savior. The church must have a response to this distortion and the redefined sense of this New Age spirituality, a pseudo-spirituality, because if we don't, we'll find that ourselves empty. New Age teachers teaching, teaching the following. I just looked on some of the websites and some of the videos, etc. and here's some of the things that from the main teachers you'll hear. Who you are requires no belief in God. Heaven is not a location. It's merely a different state of consciousness. Jesus was an archetypal image of every man and every woman. My mind is part of God. I am part of God. I am part of the collective God consciousness. I am very holy as a part of that consciousness. My holiness is my own salvation. My salvation really comes from me as part of the collective. There's no such thing as sin. The cross is irrelevant to our lives. The message of the crucifixion, you can overcome the message of the crucifixion. You don't have to embrace the cross at all to do it. Man is made and God has, I'm sorry, man has made God in his own image. The light of the world is really our consciousness. We are the consciousness of the world. God is simply a feeling experience, not something one should really believe in. The Holy Spirit is merely conditioned thinking, a voice in the head that leads to guilt for not obeying it. It's not really reality. Conviction is merely, his, is, is merely our response to historical conditioned thinking to deepen our guilt. God is not one being, but a collective spirituality of the God parts in every being. The sum of the God parts when added together. It is the God part and the owl. It's the God part and the tree. It's the God part and the deer. And it's the God part in me. All added together. Oprah herself said that she believes to believe there's only one way to God is a great mistake. How do you answer that? Because it's obvious from the millions that watched, none of them had an answer. I've talked to pastors all over the world, and very few of them have an answer. They don't understand what the New Age thinks and what the New Age believes. Is. They've spent so much time ignoring it or avoiding it, they don't know. And yet they have people leaving their congregations every year because of it. And they have people going to these fairs without them knowing it. 
To understand biblical spirituality, you have to come to understand how God views the realm of the spirit. Did you know there's 19 spiritual beings, at least 19? I, I found 19. Probably somebody smarter than me could find more. But I found 19 specifically named spiritual entities in the Bible from heaven. I bet if I asked most of us, we would have probably said three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, angels. Oh, yeah, there's cherubim, seraphim. Well, that's 12 short. Until we understand what this spirituality is, we will continue to lose people to it because we won't know how to respond to their questions. They think they're wise, but we don't, we don't even know that we as a body of Christ have a wisdom far superior to the lower earthly wisdom. And we don't, because we don't know we have that wisdom, we don't know we have access to that wisdom, that we don't utilize that wisdom and how we respond to their earthly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom is, will always defeat earthly wisdom if we know how to use it and if we have it. God has shown worldly wisdom to be foolishness, and he is still doing that if we'll let him. But it won't show it if we never talk to them. 1 Corinthians 1 says this, Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of the age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to those who believe, for the Jews request a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And James said, you can have that wisdom if you'll ask for it. When's the last time we deeply asked God for wisdom. See, wisdom from God isn't the wisdom of experience. It is not the wisdom of education. It is the wisdom that comes from on high. It is a form of revelation. The wisdom of God is the divine logic of, logic of a greater, superior wisdom. A divine logic that's higher and greater than our lower human logic. The problem for us humans is divine logic seems to be chaotic and illogical to our lower logic. Divine logic flows from the uncreated, unlimited source. It flows from deity, whereas human logic comes from that which is created and limited by the capacity, the intellectual, intellectual capacity of the human being who has it. By definition, the uncreated is more powerful than the created. The uncreated is more powerful than the created. By definition, the uncreated cannot create something greater than himself. By definition, the unlimited is greater than the limited. The grand logic of the Father, which is the greater wisdom of the Creator, is far superior than to the lower logic of the creation. No wonder Paul was able to write, we speak in a wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden mystery. Let me just, let me just throw, throw, what I want to do, I can't do everything in one message. This is what I want to do. But I, I want you to, to grasp something, the importance of what you read in the Old Testament. Let me give you an example. We hear about the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We hear about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven in Scripture. It's been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, Where, what are they? When you take a look, here's, here's a little example for you. When you take a look at the tabernacle of Moses, you're going to find the outer courtyard. And that outer courtyard is the kingdom. It is representative of the kingdom. Then you're going to find another tent inside that courtyard at the west end of that courtyard. When you're up on a hill looking down into that tent, you can't see in the tent, but you can see in the courtyard. Everybody can see that. And in that courtyard, there's two, two pieces of furniture. There is a brazen altar. There's the brazen labor. The brazen altar 
Did you know the brazen altar is the lake of fire that you don't have to go to because the sacrifice was paid for you? The first thing you encounter when you walk into the tabernacle is the reality of eternal judgment. What does the Holy Spirit do when he comes? He convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The very first thing comes is there is an eternal judgment I'm avoiding, and so immediately you should have gratitude because you don't go there. And the rest of the journey stems from that gratitude. Come to the brazen labor, polished inside, water inside, wash yourself, and as you're washing, you get in touch with who you truly are, not who you present yourself to be. But then you go into the to this tent. Nobody can see inside the tent. You can't see inside the tent from a mountain or a hillside. It's covered. And in that tent, in the first tent, the holy place, is found the mysteries of the kingdom. And in the holy of holies, the second part of that tent is found the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Why are they mysteries? Because you can't see. The only way you can find them is to walk into it. And that's what I, 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 I'm letting you know. Relationship is the key. We can't stop in the outer courtyard because all the great stuff is in the tent. Every mystery is in the tent. Every mystery. The table of showbread, the frankincense that comes from it, the golden lampstand. I wasn't going to say this. How much time do I have? I'm out jogging. I'm jogging. I, I, I jog five miles a day, six days a week. 63-year-olds, when I'm 80, I'm going to be jogging five miles a day. Because I know, I know I'm going to live to be an old man. I know that. The, the Lord has told me I'm going to live to be an old man. He gave me a choice. You can live it in bed or you can live it having fun. I said, that's not a choice. <laughs> I'm going for it. So I've been, for the last 15 years, I've been jogging. Well, so I'm out jogging early in the morning. I get up at 5 o'clock to go jog. So I'm out jogging, and somewhere along the way, I find myself no longer jogging. I'm standing on a hillside in the, in the valley floor. And I'm looking, and there in front of me is the tabernacle of Moses. The linen sheets are kind of wafing, and the light breeze is blowing. The tent is in the middle of it. It's covered badger skins, and, and all you can see on top is the badger skin. You have to wait to see the underneath side. And, a, and an angel is standing beside me, and he just kind of takes me by the arm and lets me know he, he's going to give me a tour. And so I go down, and I take a tour, and, he ta and I get to take a tour of the outer courtyard, and then I'm taken. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm jogging. I'm almost back to my house. Sweating, and so I know I finished my, my, my run. I just don't remember finishing my run. I don't even remember being in the run. I remember being with the angel in the outer court. And I'm telling you, within, within 20 seconds or less, because uh, I'm jogging along on, on the sidewalk right by the street, so the, I mean, the cars are like two feet away from me. And a rock whizzes by my ear like this big around. Whizzes by my ear, and these kids have slowed the car down, and they drive off, and they're, they're, they're yelling and, and uh, cursing me and laughing and giving me the finger, flipping me off. And I'm going, I'm an old man. What are you guys doing? <laughs> so a few days later, I'm not thinking much about this. Uh, you know, I thought it was an interesting experience, but, you know, it, it just, you get to a point where you go, well, that's one of those things. I wonder what God did there. And uh, same thing, I'm out jogging early one morning, and boom, I'm taken. And I'm, now I'm standing inside, and I'm right in front of the five golden pillars in front of the, 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 the tent, the tent of meeting, the sanctuary. And he's, and he's lifting up the tent for me, the, the curtain for me. And he tells me, you know what these five pillars are? And I go, uh, yes, but No. Because I, I tried to tell him what the brazen altar was. I tried to tell him. I said, he says, you know what the brazen altar is? He says, yeah, it's made out of uh, brass. <laughs> he goes, no. You know, what the, you know what the brazen altar is? He says, well, it's technically acacia wood covered by brass. And he goes, no. I go, well, it's, uh, it's where the sacrifice is, is placed so that sins could be forgiven. And he goes, do you know what this is? And I realized, so far I'm wrong. <laughs> and so I said, I, I don't guess I do. And he's the one who said, this 
is the lake of fire that you will never have to go to because of what Jesus did for you. He paid the price for you. Whoa. Then he starts taking me to the store. Well, now I'm in front of this, the, the sanctuary, and I got these five golden pillars in front of me. He says, you know what these are? And I'm, I know better than to say, oh, yeah. I said, no. He goes, these are the five attributes of deity. God wants, you to, wants to teach you about him in there. This is omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his immutability, his eternality. And he wants to teach you about him in there. I said, well, didn't I learn about him out there? He goes, no, you learned about what he did for you out there. You learned who he is in here. Oh, whoa. So he lifts the curtain, and then we walk in. It drops behind me, and I'm immediately into a dark room that is only lit by the menorah on the left-hand side. And the light from the menorah is hitting a solid gold wall. There were panels, but it was all gold. And it reflects off of this onto the gold paneled wall on my right side where the table of showbread is and the two stacks of unleavened bread are and the jug of wine is and the incense is, of frankincense is burning there. And the smoke from the frankincense is burning here and the smoke from the altar of incense directly in front of me has filled the room. And I realize there is no chimney in here because it was full of smoke. And he began to tell me some things. Now, I'm sure not everything. But he began to tell me some things about each one of those pieces of furniture and why they're there and the mysteries in them. And then he's, to make the story shorter, um, he has me stand in front of the, the veil and the four posts that are there, the four golden posts that are there. And I start, I'm waiting for him to pick the veil up, and he won't pick the veil up. And I start to pick the veil up, and he goes, just like puts his hand on my arm and goes. <laughs> and I know what that means. It doesn't mean keep going. <laughs> and so I stand there, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And then it starts lifting on its own. But it only lifts this high. And then he said, you can go in. And I realized the only way you get in is to bow. Almost crawl. The altar of incense is right at the height of the mouth of a man when he's on his knees praying. My, my goal is not to tell you all of that story. My goal is to simply say, we have, we have been offered so much more and we're content to stay in the outer court. But the mysteries of the kingdom are found in the sanctuary. That's where true spirituality lies. Oh, by the way, that happened to me three times. All this happened three times. Uh, after the rock three times. The next time when I came back, a, a big gulp hit me in the back of the neck and shoulder area. Different kids, different car, doing the same thing, laughing, flipping me off. Next time it happened, it was a big gulp. I'm not a big gulp, a slurpee, a giant slurpee. And then the fourth time was another giant slurpee. And I realized God was letting me know that the demonic world saw what happened to me. And it was real. It was God saying, this is real. I'm going to prove it. The demons hate what you just did. I don't know why that stuff happens to me. I don't know why strange stuff happens to me. I don't know. I don't know why I died twice and God brought me back. I don't know. Died right after I was born. Died with encephalitis at the age of of 12. I don't know. But I do know this. There is a realm of the Spirit that we can walk in that the New Age craves. 
And the reason, why they, the reason why they're not in church is not because they don't crave God. It's because they found a church that is unresponsive to their experience. We need wisdom. We need spirituality. We need the fear of God and righteousness and knowledge and discretion and prudence and counsel and understanding and power. We need all that. You see, the Holy Spirit came to take us into a whole other level of spirituality. Jesus said that, that the, the apostles or the, uh, the, the prophets of old longed to see what you're seeing this day. They longed to look into it. They longed for this experience. See, Pentecost came to make a shift, and the shift was to change and to fulfill what the prophets longed for, and that was not only is God with us, he is in us. Making that shift of of God with us to God dwelling in us. Divine fire set on the heads of each one. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. This loud ruach and pneuma of God came into the room. He came to give us power to represent him, but how well are we representing him? Are we representing our own sorrow? Or are we representing him? Are we representing our own calling? Or are we we're representing him? Are we, are we representing our disappointment at work or with our family? Or are we representing him? He came to give us power to represent him. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. But what kind of witnesses are we? We've, been far, we've become far too content, far too content. C.S. Lewis put it something like this. He said, we are children content with mud pies when a banquet table is set before us. The Holy Spirit came, and so he moved the presence of God from external to us to internal to us. But he also came to, give, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, John 16, 8. He came to ensure the resurrection of those in whom he indwells. In Romans 8, 11, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Who, who, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do you realize that when Jesus died, he left the cross, when he said, it is finished, breathe his last, he, before he was, his body was taken down, he was already in Sheol confronting Satan. He presented himself to Satan. He descended before he ascended. He presented himself to Satan. And Satan looked him over to see if there's any time he had ever compromised in any way anything that Jesus had in common with him. And Jesus was able to say, I have nothing in common with you. (laughs) Nothing. And in fact, you have sinned from the very beginning. I am sinless. Give me the keys. Simply that, I am sinless. Give me the keys. You say, Adam sinned, you sinned. I have not. Give me the keys. And he opens up the keys to Sheol, and he walks throughout Sheol, and he presents himself as, I am, like I said last night. I am everything you have ever been taught. I am the manna that came down from heaven. Then those who believed with him, believed on him, were resurrected. Some went into paradise. Some made a stop on the face of the earth. And Matthew writes that people saw the tombs open and the bodies of the dead walking the streets, giving praise and the good news about what they had heard Jesus say in Sheol. This incredible God that we serve who conquered death. Death could not hold him. Who had to resurrect from the dead. Read 1 Corinthians 15 and just remind yourself how important the resurrection from the dead was. Because it absolutely proves we have, because we follow Jesus, we have victory over that which seeks to destroy us. And yet we succumb to it so easily. There is a spiritual world, there is a spiritual life that we can live that is far superior than what we're currently living today and far, far, far superior to what the new age is living. And yet we somehow tend to admire the tranquility that the new age seems to have. The rules of the conflict, the rules of the battle are simply this. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. You're going to serve the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, intellect, 
will, emotions, you're going to serve the tree of life, wisdom, communion, conscience. We have to make this choice. We have to make this choice daily. Paul said he had to make the choice daily. We have to make the choice daily. It is a constant battle because the enemy, the enemy is faithful to keep tormenting. He is a faithful adversary. There is no term. There actually is no Hebrew word, Garden of Eden. The, the word that is used there actually means Garden of Paradise. And so when the thief is hanging on the cross and Jesus said to him, this day you shall be with me in paradise, he was already going, oh, my goodness, we're returning to the garden. You're the thief on the cross, and all of a sudden, for 4,000 years, everybody who's died has gone to Sheol with the exception of one guy, and that's Moses. And God buried his body so Satan couldn't find it in a valley in Moab, right off of Mount Nebo. The thief is on the cross, and they said, this day you'll be with paradise. And he's going, paradise, paradise. Wow, that's a lot different than Sheol. Paradise, this is really good. Paradise. You see, everybody here died. David, Samuel, Noah, Jephthah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, all. Sheol. Sheol means barren womb. It's where people went before, before Christ and for 4,000 years have been collecting people. But when Jesus came, he says, now I'm, there's a difference happening. This same spirit, this spirit that's in me, is going to raise you too. And, you, and so at that moment, for people who believe in him who die go to paradise rather than Sheol. Those who don't believe in him still go to Sheol. They're both holding tanks until the final judgment seat. This incredible spirituality that we have, this, this eternal, this, it is so different, but it sounds the same when you hear them talk about it. We make these choices every day. Paul, or John, when he writes about it, says, he writes back, he says, from the very beginning, all that's been is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And it's exactly what's been when Satan, I mean, when, when Eve was tempted by Satan. Luke shows her this tree and says it's good for food. Good for food. That's lust of the flesh. It's beautiful to see, pleasant to the eyes. That's lust of the eyes. It's desirable to make one wise. That's the pride of life. She fell to the same things. And oh, by the way, if you study Ezekiel 28, you'll find out that the, that the cherub that is mentioned there fell to the same three things. The same three things, lust of the eyes, lust of the, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. It wasn't just pride. It was all three were contained. It describes everything that he fell to. And so when he comes to earth, what he fell to, he tempts Eve with. And not only that, what he fell to, he then tempts Jesus with. In Luke chapter 4, he says, turn the stones into bread. That's lust of the flesh. He says, see all these kingdoms. That's lust of the eyes. Throw yourself down from the mountain. That's, that's a pride of life. He only knows how to tempt you in three ways, and they all stem from this tree. It really just boils down to this very, very basic, very, very simplistic. We want to make it so complicated. Every decision is one of these two trees. Choose you this day. You see, if salvation was from our intellect, our mind, only the most intelligent would know God. And revivals would have begun in seminaries centuries ago. If salvation was from our will, then only the most self-disciplined would know God. Only those who sat on a pole for 14 years or flagellated themselves to where they bled to death would know God. If, less, if, if salvation was from our emotions, then only the most ecstatic would know God. Only the most uncontrolled would know God. But it's not. It's from this tree. When you take a look at the end of the book, it's the only tree left in the garden. This one's not. This tree, this tree of life, this tree of the Spirit, it knows what we don't know. It sees what we don't see. It's not surprised by anything. It's never reacted to any move that the enemy has ever made. Why? Because if you react to the move the enemy makes, you're caught by surprise by the move the enemy made. 
And if God is all-knowing, omniscient, he's never surprised by anything, so he never makes a defensive move because he already knows all the moves Satan's going to make. And yet the New Age considers spirituality the ability to operate in a controlled state of the will, controlled state of emotions, and a disciplined state of the intellect. They continually say this is spirituality. Well, there are seven rules for spirituality, and here they are. Rule number one, not all spirit beings are equal. Not all spirit beings are equal. You see, there are spirit beings off of this tree, and everyone on this tree were created. There's a difference between, it's very important we know, there's a difference between eternality of God and everlasting. Some of our versions confuse this issue because they say, like John 3, 16, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They now translate, whoever believes in him shall help eternal life. But that is, that is a blurring of the lines between God and man. We have to keep this very, very clear. There's one eternal being. He is God. Everything else is everlasting. We as humans are everlasting when we come to know him. We're going to spend eternity somewhere, either in the lake of fire, we're going to spend it with him. We are going to be everlasting somewhere. There is two resurrections, you know, in the Bible. One to eternal damnation, one to eternal life, our everlasting life. So there are two of those, two. We need to understand that everything on this, every spirit being on this tree was created the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The fall of Satan and his angels changed specific issues in those heavenly beings who fell. It changed nothing in the unfallen realm, only in the fallen. What changed? Three things changed. First of all, they lost their light. Their radiance. They lost it. Why? Because it is proximity-centric, meaning closer I am to God, the more I radiate, further away from God I am, I lose radiance. What we don't understand is that when Satan fell and the angels fell, they didn't just lose radiance, they are continually losing radiance because they're continually falling away from him. When you read the Scriptures, you're going to find out there's five levels of darkness as evidenced by such things as darkness. Gross darkness, deep darkness, not just darkness. So the further away from him you get, the darker it becomes, and you start corresponding with that darkness. You have no light. You end up having little light, little, smaller light, smaller light, smaller light. The second thing they lost was life, L-I-F-E, life, because they were close to that which is the giver of all life. In Jesus was the fullness of life, John said. And so when they departed from him, they lost their life. And so the beauty that they once had is shriveling and decaying like a prune. They are now getting worse and worse and worse. And that which is once full of beauty and grandeur is now demonic and horrific to look at. And like the angels, angels who can take human appearance for a little while, yes, these demonic forces can take human appearance for a little while but they cannot remain in that appearance because their own appearance is shriveling and decaying, the stench of which we can smell. The third thing, the third thing that they lost, other than light and life, is they lost, as I talked about last night, their authority. They lost their authority because, again, authority is proximity-centric and relationship-centric. Thus, they, can, they kept their power because it's a gift. So they can produce various signs because of their created gift of power, but the power is also growing weaker because there's nothing there to charge the power. It's like a battery that goes weaker and weaker and weaker. The only authority that they have is amongst themselves, and it's really not authority because it is exercised by power, it's, it is like dictatorship, not through love. 
No fallen spirit being has told an unfallen spirit what they can or can't do, but, but I mean, no, no, no fallen spirit being has told any unfallen spirit being what they can do, but, but unfallen beings have told fallen beings what they can do. The unfallen angels, Gabriel and Michael, called on the authority of the name of the Lord to get the body of Moses away from Satan. Fallen spirit beings... Fallen demonic forces, fallen angels, fallen spirit beings cannot call on the name of the Lord to help. You can. Angels can. Rule number two. You cannot be spiritual alone. It requires you to accept outside help. You either do that by accepting help from God or Help from darkness. You see, if you say to a spirit guide or an ascended master or an avatar or any other number of spirit beings that they say they contact and and get guidance from, you are then asking for this. You're asking a created being to help you reach your destiny. Here... You're asking for the uncreated Holy Spirit of the living God, the very Spirit of God, to help you reach your destiny. You cannot be spiritual without the help of someone. Either you're going to ask for the Holy Spirit or you're going to ask for demonic forces. By demonic, I just say that as a general term for beings in darkness. There are actually differences in demonic forces, but for right now, ease of communication, beings in darkness. Rule number three. To be spiritual, you have to connect to the source of spirituality at the deepest level possible. You have to want that spirit. You have to embrace fellowship with that spirit. You have to communicate regularly and often with that spirit. Both will tell you you have to learn to trust or rely on that spirit. Both will say you have to become sensitive to what that spirit wants. These spirits will tell you, I will help you. They will flatter you. They will tell you, what you, they, they will tell you things that you can become, although they have no clue what you can become because they're not omniscient. But they will do so to flatter you, to gain your trust. And then if you ever try to leave this tree, guess what they do? They don't just say, oh, sorry to see you go. They then threaten you cajole you, roust you, come to you. And with violence, want to bring you back. This tree never threatens you. This spirit never violates you. There's no violence on this tree. This tree is here to help you reach your purpose. This tree is here to lead you and to guide you into all things, to teach you, to show you things to come, to reveal all truth to you. This tree is the very Spirit of God. It has all five attributes of God. The the, the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? If I send to the deepest part of the ocean, you're there. If I go to the highest heavens, you're there. If I descend to hell, you're there. This spirit is always with you, uncreated, all-knowing. But these spirits are not. They have been created, and they are not all-knowing. They are not all-powerful. They are not omnipresent. They cannot be in you and be in India at the same time. And here's what. When they decide, when you say, come into me, and they come into you, they give up their freedom in order to gain power over you. And therefore, they're not happy. On one hand, it's a great honor to be able to trick somebody into possessing them. On the other hand, they, have, they now no longer have the ability to go other places. So this is the highest place to be, but they're not willing to give you up easily either because they had to give up a lot to inhabit you. So do we want the Holy Spirit? Do we desire the Holy Spirit? Do we commune, fellowship, with the Spirit? Do we trust that Spirit? Are we sensitive to that Spirit? Years ago, God began to work with me, and he said, I want you to recognize my presence. I want to teach you how to recognize my presence. I go, 
great. I said, how are you going to do that? Take me to heaven? What are you going to do? I said, no. It's much simpler than that. I said, what are you going to do? He said, listen. Okay. Turn the radio off. Okay. Turn it back on. Well, you just told me to turn it off. Turn it on. Okay. Turn it back off. Oh, make up your mind. What is this? You're like multi, multi personality here? I'm teaching you to listen to me. Turn it off. Stop the car and go in the store. Why? I said, stop the car, go in the store. Okay. Walk in the store. Now I go back out. But I just got in. I know. Go out. And then when I wouldn't leave, if I would miss it or if I wouldn't, know, if I wouldn't do it, he, he would lift. And I'd go, oh, whoa, where, where'd you go? I could feel the blanket come off. Like a weighty blanket. That's called the kabod of God. The weighty presence of God. Then when I would obey, I'd feel him coming back on. I'd feel him, and he would take me to stores and say, sale. I go, oh, yes, I know why you want me in this store. There's a sale going on. And he goes, no. <laughs> I want you to talk to that clerk. But there's a sale. I know. Talk to the clerk. Okay, I will get a shirt over here. This looks really good. And I will take it to the clerk and use that as an excuse to talk to the clerk. No, I didn't say buy your shirt to talk to the clerk. I said, talk to the clerk. But God, you brought me into a place where the sale is. <laughs> yes, this is part of your test. <gasps> Ooh. You see, we have tests, but we don't know they're tests. We so lightly treat the presence of the Lord. And he wasn't trying to be a dictator. He was trying to make me sensitive to him, teach me to be sensitive to him. Watch the football game. What play's coming next? What do you mean what play's coming next? Is this you? You watch football? He says, what play is coming next? I will tell you if you'll listen to me. Okay. And I'd listen. And I would, I would tell my wife, I said, this is what's going what's to happen next. At, at first it's easy. Run or pass? Run or pass? Pass. <gasps> pass. <laughs> and then it would get harder. Where is he going to run? Right or left? Off tackle? Off guard? Off center? Draw play. What's it going to be? And he would tell me. And as I listened, I learned to hear. I don't know whether God's interested in football or not, but I certainly know he's interested in us listening and developing a spiritual life in him and hearing ears. We have to connect to the source in order to develop the deepest level of spiritual life. Rule number four. To receive the fullness of help from that spirit, you must become one or ingest or be infilled with that spirit. You have to invite then that spirit into your life. And the world says become one with that spirit. Invite him into your life. Invite the spirit your guide into your life. And invite the extended master to speak to you and into your life. Little do you know that you've just said to a decaying, darkening being, come in and show me what to do. A being that is cursed, you have just asked to help you. A fallen, cursed being, you have said, help me. A decaying, stinking being, you have said, help me. And you wonder why you walk under a curse. Tarot cards, palm readers, horoscopes, necromancy, all of these things come in. Over here, come in. Fill me. Endue me. Lead me. Guide me. Teach me. 
Show me. Help me. You know the future. I don't. Over here you're saying, you know the future, and they're going, <laughs> yes, I do. Your future is with me. <laughs> but we don't know it. We think they're going to take us to our destiny, why we were created. We think they're going to help us reach it, the purpose for which we were created. They have no clue. They're created beings. They don't know the future. If they knew the future, they wouldn't have rebelled because they would have known they lost. <laughs> and by the way, we know they're not, impot we know they're not omnipotent, all-powerful because they got kicked out. You can't get kicked out if you're all powerful. You're the one doing the kicking, not the one receiving the kick. <laughs> and by the way, they're not omnipresent because of how can you get kicked out of some place where you always are? And that means that they're not immutable because by being kicked out, they just changed. And they're not eternal because they didn't, they didn't know they were going to get kicked out, and they were kicked out by that which is, is eternal. So they have none of the attributes of deity unless we give them the attributes of deity and make them our God. That's in essence what this is. Whether you're unsuspecting or not, whether you know it or not, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so as this spirit comes into you, one of two things happens. On this tree, your soul begins to get bigger and your spirit begins to be enshrouded with an ever thickening capsule of your soul. Your soul begins to rule. Your spirit begins to atrophy. The unclean spirit starts the growth or the pure spirit releases your spirit to touch others. Your spirit and his spirit become one. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Those who are joined to the spirit to God, those who are joined to the Lord, are one spirit with him. You're not God, but your spirit connects to him. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 14. Spirit to spirit communication. Communicating that which is spirit with spiritual. He takes the innermost things of God and reveals it to you. What man knows the deep things of a, of, of a man except the spirit of a man that's within him? Likewise, what knows the deep things of God except the spirit of God that's within him? All revelation comes by the Holy Spirit. He may choose to give it through a dream or a vision or a visitation or by an angel. He chooses how he's going to give it, but all comes from him to us. We choose him. We long for him. We hunger for him. We desire him. The Spirit of God will teach your spirit to rule over your soul, not kill your soul, because you can't love the Lord if you don't have a soul. You can't study to show yourself approved if you don't have a soul. You can't, you can't uh, keep going after the things of God, persistence without a soul, because it's, a, it's, a, it's the will in its, in its redeemed state. So we're to become one spirit with him. You see, here's what John 14 tells us. John 14, 16 through 17 says that Jesus says, I'm going to send you the helper whom the world cannot receive because they neither know him nor see him. So here we are. This, this tree has nothing to do with that tree. This tree has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. This tree is simply the spirit of, of, the spirit of created beings that are decaying darkening and have lost authority coming into your life trying to make you think they can tell you and get you to your destiny. It is this infilling that gives you the deepest connection with God possible. It is also this infilling that will give you the deepest connection with darkness possible. Two different infillings. Rule number five. Rule number five, spirituality requires consistent communication with that spirit. The Bible calls it fellowship of the spirit. It's not through intellectual knowing. 
Your mind, again, cannot make you spiritual. Intellect cannot change what I do not know. But an all-knowing spirit can. So here they say they require you. They start putting heavier and heavier requirements on you. You will talk to me. You will do this. You will do that. And you will listen. You will wait here. You will go here. All the things kind of that the tree here says, but in a different way and a different attitude. This tree threats you, threatens you. This tree woos you. Woos you. I want to talk to you. Come talk to me. Commune with me. Gives you hope for the future. And at the same time, doesn't mince the changes you need to make today. But it doesn't do so by threats. It does so by showing you your future. He will show you things to come, John 16, 13. Oneness with that Spirit turns your life around one way or another and then connects you to the giver of that Spirit. You'll either connect to God, or you, the Father, or you'll connect to Satan. And by the way, Satan is not his name. Satan is a title. Technically, it is the Satan. God removes Satan's name. No one knows what Satan's name was before the fall. All he has left is titles. Abaddon is still a title. Lucifer is still a title. And Satan is still a title. They are not names. But you didn't know that. Oh, some of you did. Good. So counterfeit spirituality then is to host a decaying spirit. True spirituality is to host an ever-life-giving spirit. True spirituality is to tap into the source of everything that is truly everything. Counterfeit spirituality is to tap into a source that makes you think you know everything when you know nothing. Rule number six. You must follow and obey the spirit. The very spirit of the one who is the spirit. You have to follow and obey that spirit. Are they, this tree will get mad and hurt you. This tree will lift to draw you back. To follow anything less than a pure spirit is to, by definition, have a lower spiritual dark life. Spirituality is no greater than the spirit that sustains it. So we have to utilize the source. And yes, there could be temporary surges but it is not to be interpreted as a consistent flow. For example, you can have electrical surge, ask your computer. Or those of you that know about electronics, see why, why your receiver burnt out. Or your speakers blew. Surges of electricity. A lightning bolt is a surge of electricity, but it doesn't last long. Here, constant, even flow of spirit. No surges. We well, say, well, I get touched at other times. That's not a surge. That's the presence. Different. The presence of the Lord is different than the surge of the Spirit. Light, light can recreate light. Light has mass. Light has density. Light has speed. Light has texture. Darkness has no speed, no density, no texture, and the only thickness or anything that it has is merely by the absence of light. True spirituality is a result of knowing and becoming one. Rule number seven, the last one. True spirituality is transformational. True spirituality literally transforms the person. It regenerates every part of us. It is part of the preparation for the final transformation to our terrestrial body. It starts the sperma of God embedding in your spirit. The word seed that John uses and Peter uses is the, the Father's seed is in you. That's the Greek word sperma. His sperma has come into us. Soon, Pressure is placed on our soul and, our, and it begins to break apart and our spirit begins to permeate through the brokenness of our soul. We be, start becoming that which we didn't become before. 
And here's nine things you'll begin to see in this final stage. Humble love and concern for others more than yourself. Contagious joy that others feel and take on when they are near you. Tranquil peace when life's events do not go the way you anticipated. Steadfastness and long-suffering in the midst of betrayal or deep disappointment. Gentleness with others who are weaker or less capable than you. Goodness in seeking the well-being of others over your own well-being. Faith in the unseen and not yet purposes of God. Meekness or softness evidenced by how we handle others when they disagree with us. And temperance or the ability to master our own passions and desires. God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And he takes the weak and makes them strong and mighty in battle. That's true spirituality. That's the spirituality that we want. The world is waiting for, but they see it in so few of us. Father, may we become everything you've called us to be. And may your name be glorified. And may we be true witnesses of who you are to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you see God moving and delivering them right there. They'll get up. And out of those eight out of, those eight out of ten, eight out of those ten will come up and say, I just met Jesus, didn't I? Now, you see, we don't have to tell them who he is. We tell them who he is without telling them who he is. See, it's very important that we understand the power of God to prove himself. We carry something inside of us that make him known to those who didn't know he existed like this. We carry a spirituality that is so foreign yet so attractive, but we don't know how to present who we are to them. One of the first times we ever did an outreach in a, in a New Age fair, it was a very large Coliseum type of, of place, uh, covered, domed, huge outreach, and um, had incredible people. The Kabbalah was sending us their people to get their dreams interpreted. I mean, it was really kind of strange. We, came, we became like, in, in one four-day period, we became like the experts in, it, in things. And, and so God was touching and moving. And at the end of it, I went up to the woman. I said to her, is it, is it okay if we come back next year? And she goes, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you. And I go, uh-oh. I said, well, something wrong? She goes, well, wrong is not really the word. I have to ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, go ahead and ask. She said, I don't know. Please don't be offended. I said, okay, I promise I won't be offended. She said, are you a spiritual vampire? I'm telling you, that was not on my chart right at that moment. <laughs> Are you a spiritual vampire? And I go, no. No, I said, why? She said, because we've had a lot of complaints that whenever you get near any booth here, they lose their ability to read people. <laughs> at the end of the week. They'll set it on fire. This man, this wooden man they build, they'll set on fire, and they'll throw all their cares, cares into the fire, believing that that will burn up their past and start a whole new life for them. They do the same thing every year. <laughs> when we started going there over eight years ago, we were... You're put into the semicircle in the order of your popularity or newness. So if you're on the back row of the semicircle, then you're a brand new tent. And if you're on the front row, then you're 
among the most popular tents. We are on the, have, for the last three years, have been on the front row. Among the top five out of 52,000. Not because we compromise the word, but because we show them something they've never seen before. We have lines of people that will line up outside of the tent that will wait anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours just to get into the tent to pick from a menu board that we have called Spirit Cafe Menu. <laughs> so we have dr dream interpretation, pretty obvious. We have spiritual readings, which is prophecy, spiritual cleansing, which is deliverance, and, and, and so on. And spiritual alignment and, and all these things, they have, there's Christian meanings behind it, but we use terminology that will pique their interest. We have people come to Jesus every year there, and we have people come to Jesus after they leave there because the Holy Spirit won't let them go. We have teachers, doctors, attorneys, judges, not only from the United States, from multiple different countries that will come there. We do the same thing in Salem, Massachusetts. We do the same thing at Mardi Gras. We do the same thing at, at, at Sundance Film Festival. We, teams go out all over the United States, all over the world. They used to never go out. But we've learned some things in the process. We've learned some things about how, how things work. We've gotten wiser. We've gotten shrewder. We, we know how to, how to work it better because we don't, again, we don't compromise, but we talk about Jesus. For example, who is the true light of the world? There is only one. It's not Krishna. It's not some avatar. It's not some ascended master. It's not some swami. It's not some guru. There's only one. And so people come to meet him there. People wonder about our aura. You go, oh, you can't have an aura and be a Christian? Look. How many of you have said, I'm going to have an aura or not going to have an aura? <laughs> it's not like it's your choice. <laughs> what did Moses have when he came down from the mountain? See, we get so caught up in our Christian terminology that we, we forget there's an unreached world out there. And so... They say, you have an aura. And I, and I go, great. They say, well, it's really unusual. We don't see auras like yours here very often. <laughs> great. <laughs> well, what does your aura mean? Have you ever studied your aura? I said, yes. <laughs> well, what does your aura mean? I said, it comes from the perfect light. <gasps> oh. The pure light. Oh. Well, can I know that pure light? Can I have, lay hands on me. Now get this, I say, lay hands on me and give me this pure light. I say, I can't do that. I can't give you the pure light. Only you can ask him for it and he will freely give it. Well, how do I ask? How do I ask for this pure light? What do I do? How do I ask for this pure light? Very easy. Just say, pure light of the world, make yourself known to me. And it's, if you really believe it, if you're really hungry for it, you're not dabbling around. He doesn't believe in dabbling. He isn't going to touch you if, you, if you're just saying, I want to dabble in another light. Because he's a very jealous light. <laughs> and I have to warn you, before you ask for this pure light, once you get this pure light, every other light will seem so dim to you. And you'll end up, you'll end up not going to the light you used to go to. Are you ready to do that? For the pure light? Yes. <laughs> of course. Okay, eight out of 10 
who pray that prayer will drop like a rock in two seconds. And you watch their body move and continue. They say, if we go there and we do dream interpretations and spiritual readings. And I said, great idea, let's, let's do it. So we went to the bookstore, my interns did, they went to the bookstore and they met with the, the manager of the bookstore and the manager said, okay, I had a dream eight years ago, no one has been able to interpret. And if you can interpret it, I'll give you a shot. So she sat down at her desk and, and told the dream, and they got the interpretation. Told her the interpretation. In, during the interpretation, she slides out of her chair onto the floor, crying behind her desk. She gets up and says, okay, I'll give you a shot. <laughs> well, she gives us the worst possible time, like seven to nine o'clock on a Saturday night the, the, in the middle of the month when everybody's already spent their money because she didn't know how well we would go over. We went there, interpreted dreams, prophesied. That's what spiritual readings is. It's really prophecy. And by the end of the night, we had to carry people to their cars <laughs> because they still hadn't composed themselves enough to walk out on their own. They had people coming back to the store saying, when are they coming back? When are they coming back? We will pay for them to come back. Whatever the cost is, we'll pay for it. The impact was so, so great. Now, 20 plus years later, that is happening all over the United States and all over the world, actually. Back in, 19, in the 1990s, it was happening nowhere. We received an incredible amount of criticism because of it. How dare you take the gospel to those who are in the new age or in the occult? And I said, where were you before you got saved? <laughs> you may not have been in the new age or the occult, but you were far from God. And I said, this is the largest unreached people group in America. What do you mean don't go near them? So the Lord began to take us into those incredible environments. And he began to talk, talk with us and teach us. And we begin to talk with them and teach them. We go into incredible places like Burning Man. For the last number of years we've been in Burning Man. That's where a week-long festival in the high desert of Nevada, 52,000 tents will be set up in a semicircle around a 30-foot tall wooden structure that will burn. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you for making me feel so welcome, and uh, thank you for everybody that's grabbed me in the hallways and elevators and <laughs> everywhere. It's a, quite, a, quite a joy. God has uh, done some great, great and wonderful things, hasn't he, in all of our, in all of our lives, all of our lives. Again, I want to say thank you, Randy, for inviting me, and uh, again, I count it as an honor to be here. I don't, I don't say that with flattery. I don't say that frivolously. I say that because I mean that. So it's very, very good to be here. Last night, we talked about, about the issue of power and authority, and we see power a lot in the church, but we don't see a lot of authority in the church, especially, especially demonstrative authority. And, and when you, when you, I mentioned that you conquer with power, but you rule with authority. The, the right hand of the king is, is power. Kill this guy, raise this guy up. Left hand is authority. Build this road, put the, these people in jail. It's, it's authority. It's within the kingdom. Authority is within the kingdom. Power is for outside to expand the kingdom. The problem is... There's so many spiritual leaders who try to rule with power instead of ruling with authority. And when you rule with power, you become a dictator. When you rule with authority, you do so because you have favor with God and man. 
And so dictators rule by positional authority versus popular or the people's authority. And so we want to always, we leaders always want to recognize that while we don't do the will of the people, we do the will of God, God puts it into the hearts of the people to give us favor. We don't just, we can't demand it. Again, if we demand it, that's called power. And that's what dictators are made of. That's what tyrants are made of. So I felt like it was important to say that before I begin the, the teaching this afternoon. I've been involved 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, some, some of my interns came to me and they said, John Paul, we, we noticed that down at one of the bookstores here in, in, in the area, which is at that time Fort Worth, Texas, that they're doing, they're doing psychic readings, horoscope readings, and uh, tarot card readings, and what, what 